Hello, hello, hello. We're going to talk about the solution of the solid disk which is oscillating back and forth. It's rolling and it's oscillating back and forth inside a hollow cylinder. Here is the hollow cylinder, radius capital R. Here is the disk with radius small r. The disk is solid and the disk has mass m. And this disk can be rolling back and forth. And if this angle theta here is a small angle, then we get what we call small angle approximations. Then the motion of this rolling disk is a simple harmonic motion. And the question for you is, what is the angular frequency of that motion? Or, which is of course the same, what is the period of that motion? What does it mean that the object is in pure roll? Pure roll means there is no slip. Yes, there is friction between the disc and the hollow cylinder. If there were no friction, it couldn't be in pure roll all the time. Friction is essential, but it never slides. So there is no heat produced. So energy is conserved. Keep that in mind. Look up on Google the definition of pure roll. The first thing it will tell you is that the point of contact between the rolling object and the surface on which it rolls at any moment in time stands still. The second thing it will tell you is that if any point on the circumference of the rolling object has moved over a certain distance, the center of that rolling object, in our case the center of mass, has moved over exactly that same distance. Let's evaluate that in my drawing. First, the disc was here, and this is point A on the disc. A little later, when the object has rolled up to this point, A is here. So that means that the angle over which the rolling object has moved is this angle phi. Namely from here to there. So it has rolled over an angle phi. That means the length along this circumference, the length measured in centimeters or meters, this length here must be phi times r. Phi is the angle in radians. If phi were 2 pi radians, this arc would be 2 pi r. Now, it is phi times r. So keep in mind that this length is phi times r. There you see it. That must be the same as the distance over which the center of mass has moved. It was here and it is now there. So the length of this portion must be identical to the length of that portion. If this angle is theta, I call that theta, then the length of this portion is obviously theta times this distance, which is capital R minus little r. So this equation is key. This is really telling you that the object is in pure roll condition, at all moments in time. Now comes the next important step. I'm now going to make use of the fact that if something is in pure roll, rotating nicely about the center of mass, is equivalent to saying that the object also, at any moment in time, rolls about that point P. I've mentioned that earlier 
in one of my solutions of one of my yo-yo problems. If it's rotating about the center of mass with angular velocity phi dot, which unfortunately is sometimes called omega, so if it is rotating about the center of mass with angular velocity phi dot, that is equivalent in pure roll condition that the entire disk is rotating about point P with angular velocity phi dot. For now you have to accept that. If you want to see the proof of that, try to find that proof on the web. So I'm going to make use of that fact. If you accept that fact, then it's clear that the torque about point P must be the moment of inertia about point P times phi double dot, which is the second derivative of the angle phi. The moment of inertia about point P, it's a solid disk, the moment of inertia about the center would be one half mr squared, but you have to use the parallel axis theorem, so you have to add mr squared over this distance, so that gives you 3 halves mr squared. And then you have phi double dot, which is the angular acceleration, for which we sometimes have used the symbol alpha. It's much clearer that you see it as phi double dot. It's the first derivative of the angular velocity phi dot. So that now equals to the torque relative to point P. The torque is restoring. What that means is the torque will always try to drive it back to equilibrium. If you have a spring with a mass m at the end and you stretch the spring, the spring constant always wants to drive the object back to equilibrium. So therefore we also have a minus kx there. ma is minus kx. For the same reason we have now a minus sign for the torque. The torque is restoring. What is the torque relative to point P? Of course there is a force through point P, but any force that goes through point P, the torque relative to point P is zero. That's obvious. So the only force for which the torque is not zero is this mg. So what is the torque relative to point P? That is, the magnitude is this force, times the distance from P to this force. And that distance here is R sine theta, because this angle is theta, it's the same as this angle. So, we see here that 3 half mR squared phi double dot equals minus mg times R times sine theta. Because this is R sine theta. For small angle approximation, sine theta is the same as theta in radians. If you don't believe it, try 1 degree, try 5 degrees, try 10 degrees, and you'll be impressed, even at 10 degrees, how close the sine of 10 degrees is to 10 degrees in radians. So, the sine theta will be replaced by theta. We do a little bit of high school algebra, and we end up with this differential equation. And that differential equation obviously tells you that the motion is simple harmonic. Yes, we have used small angle approximation, but then it's simple harmonic. And then the value of omega, the angular frequency, is the square root of this one divided by this one. And so you see that here, and so the period of one oscillation is then 2 pi divided by omega, and you see that here. So that's the answer to the problem. Are there other ways to find that answer? Oh yes. At least two other ways that come to my mind. Some of you may prefer that. One is that you make use of the Lagrangian, and the other one is that you use the conservation of energy. It's also possible, but it is a much longer route to find 
that differential equation that I found by using conservation of energy. So be my guest if you want to do that. There is no doubt in my mind that the solution that I showed you here is by far the fastest. At least I believe so. Okay. So here is a portion of that inner, of that of the cylinder, I just only drew the bottom portion, radius capital R, and here is an object with radius little r, and that could be rolling back and forth, and if the angle theta is small, then we get simple harmonic motions. Let's first briefly discuss, suppose it wasn't rolling, but it was just a little piece could be a little cube, not rolling, but sliding. And let's suppose that there was no friction. So it would be sliding back and forth with no friction. Small angle approximation gives you this as the period of the oscillation. Remember, if it were a pendulum with length L, you get of course the same solution, the same physics, you would get 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Well here L happens to be R, so this is obviously the period if an object were sliding back and forth without friction. Here is our solid disk solution. We have here the 3 over 2 R minus R. And if you take a solid sphere, the moment of inertia about the center of a solid sphere is two-fifths mr squared, but you have to use the parallel axis theorem, so you have to add mr squared, so that gives you seven-fifths mr squared. So therefore, we re here we have 3 over 2, which is the immediate consequence of the moment of inertia about point P of the rolling solid disk. Here we have 7 over 5, which is the consequence of the moment of inertia of a rolling, solid rolling sphere about that point P. Why am I showing you this? Well, let us assume that little r is much, much smaller than capital R. Just to give you a little bit of feeling for it. So if little r is really much, much smaller than capital R, you can forget this little r. And so then the conclusion is that a solid disk, the period of a solid disk, is then about 22% larger than the period of a sliding object. And the period of a rolling solid sphere is about 18% larger than a sliding object. Because now all I have to do is take the square root of 3 halves and the square root of 7 fifths, because I have assumed that little r can be ignored relative to capital R. So now comes the question that I have asked during my 801 lectures to students. Without deriving these numbers 3 over 2 and 7 over 5, why is it that for a rolling object, the time to oscillate, one complete oscillation, must be larger than for a sliding object? Without any calculations, you should be able to argue that. And the reason is then the following. If the object is sliding, then all gravitational potential energy, mgh, that is available, all is converted to the translational motion of the center of mass. So that determines at all moments in time the speed of the center of mass. However, if an object is rolling, then that gravitational potential energy that is available 
is not only in the translational motion of the center of mass, but also rotational kinetic energy. So therefore, the speed of the center of mass at all moments in time will be lower for a rolling object than for a sliding object. And so even though in both cases no energy is lost, the time for one oscillation must be longer for rolling objects than for sliding objects. Okay, this may not have been the easiest problem, but I think it's a very nice one. So, let's be friends, have a nice day, and take care. <laughs>